Hello students, this is my first attempt at creating a video lecture. This is going to be the first of three videos emphasizing the important causes and consequences of World War I. This video lecture is a companion to the full lecture that is available in PDF format in Google Classroom. That PDF has all the links embedded. You can just click on the links to access the video. When I prompt you, I ask that you pause this video, open up the PDF of the full lecture in another window and click on and view the videos. Then come back and continue the video. We're gonna see how this works. So this is video number one. I'm going to cover the causes, conducting the war, total war and the home front in World War I. I will not go to all of the slides. I will simply point out some things that I would like you to know. I will be asking you feedback on these videos, how useful they are, um, if you have any uh, recommendations, um, I want these to have the most benefit as possible. You can watch these at your convenience. I will not be presenting them in class. So they will not be playing this whole video on Tuesdays or Thursdays, your choice of attendance during the online class. I will simply reference them. So this video, is in week one of distance learning folder in Google Classroom. So let's go, go, get going on this. Again, this is my first time, so bear with me. So unit seven readings, um, as 1900 to the present will not be tested on this year's exam, I've canceled any required AMSCO readings for you, but however, those readings are still posted in the folder for Contemporary Era, 1900 to the present. Feel free to read them, refer to them. Required assignments, due by. You need to check Google Classroom for those due dates. We have a reading and comment on school closings during 1918 Spanish flu and COVID-19 pandemics. And we also have eight puzzles on World War I, the interwar years, and World War II. These are the learning objectives for the time period 1900 to the present for Unit 7, all right, global conflict. They are not expressly uh, tested on the exam. However, I'm going to try to make as many connections as possible to content that will be tested. That's 1200 to 1450, the, the post-classical era, 1450 to 1750, the early modern era, and 1750 to 1900 for the modern era. So here we go. In your PowerPoint, take a look at it. Time grid is in the PowerPoint lecture. What's going on at the time? What I'd like you to do now is pause this video lecture, open the full lecture PowerPoint in another window, click the link, and view the video. When you're finished, return to this video lecture. Okay, you should have finished the video. We're moving on. Need to know, World War I is the first total war. That is a mobilization of everyone. Not only are soldiers part of this, but so are uh, civilians. So we're gonna talk about the causes. And we ended, right before spring break, as we ended at 1900, I went over with you the causes of World War I. This called MENA. Militarism is an aggressive arms race. Battleships were the death weapon in World War I. You needed to control the seas to win this war. Imperialism, Western European and America were competing for new colonies 
And so that competition for empire was a cause. Nationalism, I pledge allegiance. So you are going to um, have different areas wanting to break free from the empires, such as Serbia and the Balkan states wants to break free of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then finally, the alliance system. I ended right before spring break setting you up with the allies. So countries in Europe had formed alliances with each other. What that means is that if your friend, your ally is attacked, you're not, but your ally is, you are obligated to back him up. You have their back. That's how a small war goes to a global war. So in the central powers, you have Germany, Austria, uh, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. In the allied powers, you have Great Britain, France, and Russia. Now, just to let you know, Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm and Great Britain's King George V were first cousins. They were grandsons of Queen Victoria of England. Russia's Tsar Nicholas II was also related to the British royal family, and his wife, the Tsarina, the Empress Alexandra, was the favorite granddaughter of Queen Victoria. In fact, after her mother died, she spent most of her childhood and early years living at Windsor Castle. Two and a half years later, in 1917, the USA will enter the war. So, I need you to pause the video lecture and open the full lecture PowerPoint in another window. Click the link and view this video. This is from the BBC. It was created on the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I, 1914. Um, there is a disclaimer. It does contain some offensive language, but it's a good PowerPoint. So pause the video, go click the link, and I'll be back in a moment. So, you finished the video. Gavrilo Princip was in the video. He's a Serbian nationalist. He wants independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is nationalism. He's going to assassinate the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. This is not a cause. This is not a specific cause. This is simply the match that's going to set off the other four causes. Germany is an ally of Austria-Hungary. It's going to back Austria. Russia, who's allied with Serbia, is going to back the Serbs. And in fact, what they're going to do is mobilize the army. They're going to get prepared. Germany will see this as a threat and declare war on Russia. Do you remember who Russia's allies were? France and Great Britain have to back their ally, their friend, Russia. They declare war on Germany. The war begins. Pause this video lecture now. Open up the full lecture PowerPoint. Click on the link. When you finish, come back to the video. I'd like you to take time to look at this. I'm not going to cover this. Battle plan is called the Schlieffen plan. The objective is to hold the Russians from advancing while you concentrate on taking Paris. This is a war on two fronts. Hitler will do the same thing in World War II. World War I, the Schlieffen plan will not be successful. In World War II, it will be done a different way by Adolf Hitler, and it will be successful. The Schlieffen plan is gonna fail in World War I. At the Battle of the Marne, it's a stalemate. That's like in chess. Nobody can actually make a move. So you result, uh, resort to trench warfare. The war now becomes not about taking territory because you're just going back and forth. At the Battle of Verdun, you have over 700,000 lives lost. 
this is where World War I changes. It's not about territory anymore because nobody's getting anywhere. The objective now becomes to make the other side give up by creating mountains of corpses. So World War I was a combination. They were learning new military technology. How the heck do they fight this type of war? So what you see here is a photograph of a German soldier, and he's in two different worlds. He's in the old world, the old way of fighting war, because he's on horseback. He's a cavalryman. He's even covering a big spear or spike or pike to stab other uh, cavalrymen as they come against him. But again, he's wearing uh, signs of new technology. He's carrying a rifle and he has on a gas mask to protect him from gas. I would like to refer, to you, refer you to the film War Horse by Steven Spielberg, which deals with the story of a young man and his horse during World War I. I'd like you to pause the video and click on the link below to play a game. It's a multiple choice. Can you figure out what World War I inventions we still use today? I'll be back in a minute. Welcome back. I hope you got, were you surprised by some of the inventions? <laughs> so here's a need to know for AP, although it will not be tested. There are a lot of parallels to things in the past. You have new military technologies are developed such as the use of machine guns, long range artillery, that's large shells shot at a, quite a distance. You have submarines, battleships, poison gas, the first introduction of tanks, grenades, the pineapple as what the allies used and continue to use in World War II and the potato masher, which was used by the Germans. Um, it looked like a potato masher. And in case you, and of course, you have the introduction of air warfare, airplanes and zeppelins. Airplanes and zeppelins were used in World War I for reconnaissance, for dropping bombs. However, it's, they're basically learning how to control air, the airspace. Um, and those things they learn will be applied in World War II. But what happens as a result of all of these weapons, these new weapons? It's easier to kill. You rarely see the face of your enemy. In fact, in World War II, a lot of World War II pilots suffered um, heavily from post-traumatic stress disorder because they never saw who they were killing when they dropped their bombs on, uh, dropped their bombs. Um, in things such as firebombing, which we'll talk about in World War II, um, it was only after the war that many of them came to really think about the death that they caused. So here's some photographs of trench warfare. So, I mean, how do you think people would live in something like this for long periods of time? In the upper left-hand corner, you see photographs, see all the mud and the water in the base of the trench. Movie reference, if any of you have seen Forrest Gump, Lieutenant Dan, his number one piece of advice to Forrest when he arrives in Vietnam in the 1960s is to keep his feet dry, to wear his socks and make sure they're clean and dry. This is where we get the um, fungal infection. The name is called trench foot. This is a cross section of a trench system. You would see an opposite one on the opposite side. Note here, this is known as no man's land. If you came over the top, and these are all slang terms that we've kept from the war, you came over the top to charge the other side. Many people lost their lives here. This is an aerial photograph of opposing trenches in no man's land. Um, take a moment to look at it. 
This is Verdun Battlefield today. This is not natural. This is from all the artillery shells. In fact, artillery shells are still found um, live artillery buried in this area. So trench art. So soldiers often will, will pick up shells, spin shells, and they decorate them and send them home. I have one of these sitting on my shelf just under our TV in our classrooms, I don't, in my classroom. I don't know if you ever noticed it. I usually pass it around uh, for class, um, but I just wanted to let you know what this is. Um, this is a howitzer. This is actually World War II era howitzer. This is the type of gun or artillery that would fire these 44 millimeter shells. Pause the video lecture. Open up the full lecture PowerPoint in another window. Click the links and watch these three short videos. Most of these videos are no more than two to three minutes long. I'll be right back. Welcome back. This is a pen and ink drawing by the German artist Otto Dix. Otto Dix had his best friend. This is a portrait of his friend. His friend had died in trench warfare. They had nowhere to bury him, so he was buried in the wall of the trench. About nine months later, there was a severe a rainstorm that washed away some of the trench war, uh, walls and his friend's corpse was exposed. Otto Dix did this pen and ink drawing portrait of his friend. Otto Dix went on to fight in World War II and was captured by the Americans and spent the remainder of World War II in a POW camp. Pause the video lecture now. Open up the full lecture, click the link, view the video, and when finished, please return to this lecture. See you in a moment. So that's all for lecture one. Next lecture that I'll be recording and posting on Google Classroom through a YouTube link will cover the Russian Revolution, the USA coming into the war, and defining what is propaganda. Remember, the entire PowerPoint lecture is in PDF format with clickable links in, and is available in Google Classroom. Um, while I'm offering these three video lectures to you, they are not required viewing, but the PowerPoint PDF is required. In addition, I want you to be prepared for SAQ practice or other activities related to that PDF lecture. So we're done with lecture one. Let's see how I did. I hope it worked. See ya.